good conversation. We've been trying to get to this point for a couple months now, I think. Um, so Jem um, originally came to my attention with, um, what was the name of that, that earlier paper? Deep Adaptation? That's right. Yeah. 2018, five, over five years ago now. Yeah, which really had an impact on a lot of people that I, that I knew and got shared around a lot and, um, uh, you know, made more people aware of how severe the ecological uh, emergency was. And uh, five years later, roughly, followed it up with Breaking Together, uh, which is a terrific book, uh, definitely not for the, the faint of heart. Uh, but hmm. um, yeah, definitely something that people need to, uh, you know, uh, know about and read and, and, and think through. Um, yeah, but a couple of, you know, momentary data points. Uh, you know, we've, I've been in New York this weekend, which is the end of October, and it was like 80 degrees last night, you know, at 3 a.m., you know, Halloween revelers were out on the sidewalks, you know, girls in their, their thongs and bikinis, not even shivering. Uh, like I've never seen, you know, it being warm like this. It just, it just feels like the warming curve. I mean, it's sort of documented all around the world has uh, taken off uh, on a vertical at this point. Um, so that was interesting. And we're speaking, obviously, as this, uh, you know, uh, Israeli uh, Gaza war is happening, um, you know, with all the with all the sort of parameters of that and ancient history there. And then also, you know, thinking about your work and other, and other people who've been studying global warming and climate change, I, you know, sort of wonder, okay, they're fighting over these like pieces of desert uh, and they're all hating each other for these thousands of years. But, um, you know, what happens when that area becomes just unlivable, you know, which could be like 10, 15 years away. And what, are they, what, are they, what have they been fighting for? You know, I mean, um, so that was on my mind. And the last little data point of my weekend was uh, reading, uh, what's his name? Mark Andreessen, you know him? Oh, yeah. Mm. He's one of the biggest, uh, most influential uh, investors in uh, Silicon Valley. And he just published a, a piece called the, uh, the Tech Optimist Manifesto, uh, where he, where he um, you know, basically argues, you know, that tech is the most positive thing in the world, that we should not try to limit its development, whether it's like AI, and, and actually tech is our only hope to you know, uh, for progress, to save the world. And he even, he even sort of looks at people who are into things like sustainability as like his, his enemies uh, and sort of calls them out and when, when he's talking about the people who might, you know, be, be against this type of hyper progress uh, that could bring about, you know, beneficial, uh, you know, progress for everybody. Um, wow, I'm, I'm so surprised. I've never heard those ideas before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So data points from my side. Yeah, I'm glad we finally um, got to chat. I'm back in the UK. This is actually my father's uh, lounge, and this is where um, he had term. He he passed away just a few days ago, and that's why I'm back here. But um, it wasn't a surprise. He had terminal cancer for wow, I don't know, twenty months, I think, and um, and I. I owe him quite a lot because I left my normal life to come and live with him for a bit in this flat where I know nobody in this town. And just if it wasn't for that, and if it wasn't for my dad, whenever I bring him a cup of tea, because he was bed bound saying, how's the book going? Because he knew I had a deadline and he, and he was just basically saying, no, don't stay here and watch telly, go back and do the book. He was, And so this really drove me on. So. I'm sort of back here and I'm thinking very, wow, wow. I mean, yeah, if it wasn't for dad, the first half of the book wouldn't have got done because it was a, it was a hard slog um, going through all the scholarship on, on, you know, what's breaking in societies. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm back here and it's, it's, um, I'm feeling a bit proud of myself and actually oddly grateful that that all these things came together. And so that book got done um, partly because of my dad's terminal cancer, really. <laughs> I don't know what book would have been otherwise. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, but, well, in, in uh, Breaking, um, you talk about um, the path that led you to write the book and how it was basically like the last thing you wanted to do. And I was just <laughs> in the introduction feeling tremendous uh, empathy for um, how kind of ridiculous, you know, what an awful position to, you know, be spreading this message that most people don't want, 
that costs you, uh, you know, money and position, and yet feeling that, um, you know, that, that somebody has to, to, to sort of push it forward, you know, even though it's... Yeah, it was for a long time, I wasn't... For a long time after that deep adaptation paper went viral, um, I didn't really want to shout from the rooftops about this stuff. Um, I was very nervous about bringing this message and how to do it, and I was concerned about the emotional impact. But a lot's changed in five years. Um, the opinion I talk about it in the book. Opinion polls show that people no longer believe that um, their kids are going to have a better life than them. Uh, so many people think that climate change is going to collapse societies. But all this stuff is kept taboo in mainstream media and in a populist alternative media, really. Um, uh, and so, you know, we have to stay positive somehow. Uh, in other, otherwise, it's somehow disgusting and disgraceful. And um. And yet that suppression of the anxieties that people understandably have can lead to all manner of derangement and manipulation. And and I saw that that's probably why nostalgia politics has taken off worldwide uh, in the last, say, seven years um, everywhere, not just uh, make America great again, you know, or take back control in Britain, but, but everywhere, you know, people uh, electing dictators, sons and that kind of thing. So like the right wing has has sort of tuned into this because all they're in, into is winning power and keeping power. But the the so-called progressives, liberals, leftists, still wedded to old ideas about progress, assuming that, you know, we can somehow, if we get the right policies, the right people in power, uh, we'll fix all the problems. And, and I wanted to encourage a solidarity-based politics for what I see as an era of collapse and yeah, an era of breakdown, an era of regress and retraction. And so, um, and I felt, yeah, I couldn't walk away. I couldn't just, you know, go do Kirtan and Buddhist meditation retreats and organic farming and all sorts of good fun stuff. I couldn't do that and anticipate a general derangement of, of public dialogue and, and, um, and not have at least tried. <laughs> I don't know if I'll succeed in doing anything, but I felt I had to try. And and then I realized to actually get a good hearing on this, I've got to really study um, what, 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 where are we at with societal disruption, breakdown and possibly collapse. And so then when I went into that more and more and more, I realized that, oh, it was far worse than I'd imagined before. And there's a good evidence base to argue it's already begun, meaning the, the collapse of modern industrial consumer societies, which is an ongoing process slowly unfolding ultimately going to affect everyone everywhere um so yeah it was uh yeah. I'm, I'm pleased i'm through the other side and i'm i'm looking forward to what some people call more the the, the post doom vibe um but at the moment i'm still talking to people about the the, the sadness the anxiety the grief the letting go before you can let come and reimagine. Um, so, so what you're saying, but I'll be done with that soon, and I'll just wanna, I'll just wanna live to the max in this new context. In this new, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so I, you know, you've all sorts of questions run into my mind, and you know, want to be like uh, tumbling forward. Uh, what, what is yeah. I'm just curious? You know. Um, What's your perspective? Like, what would you say the likelihood is of humanity just actually going extinct, let's say, in this century? Do you think it's, um, you know, probable, possible, inevitable at this point? Um, uh, so, um, firstly, uh, we're at least the 15th homonym um, where the previous ones didn't blend into us and went extinct. So I think there are 14 homonyms that didn't become us. Um, they went extinct. And so the, this planet produces big brain bipedal apes that uh, end up looking and talking a bit like us, I guess, at least singing, making noises a bit like us and maybe dancing around and s scratching things on walls, who knows, but um, and then going extinct. So um, Homo sapiens will go extinct. Um, when and why? Don't know. Um, it could be uh, this century because of 
all manner of things. Um, it could be because of the toxicity that we've already released into the environment, forever chemicals, uh, how they then combine with uh, microplastics and what that might then do to the oceans, what's already happening, what that might then do to the atmosphere, or climate change itself, uh, particularly with these uh, self-reinforcing feedbacks that uh, there's obviously scientific debate about how many of those amplification feedbacks have begun and how much is uh, how much we can might be able to moderate things. We might get super desperate or a bunch of billionaires might get super desperate and try and do some geoengineering and it all go terribly wrong. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's very, you, you know, it's incredibly difficult to then sort of, and to say, what did you say? Probably, possibly, um, or certainly going extinct this century. Uh, um, it's a distinct possibility that the human race will go extinct this century because of the damage we've done to the environment and the knock on effects that will do for, to society, to aggression, to war and all manner of bad stuff. Um, do I think it's probable this century? <sighs> um, no, but I'm paying attention over the last five years uh with a bit of a hawkeye when i look at like okay what's happening with methane in the yeah. atmosphere if because that's that's the quickest route to to us going extinct which is if if we are we, if we do begin to see more subsea frozen methane actually uh make it to the make make it out uh make it to the surface in the arctic um a lot of it most of it just dissolves in the water column but um that would then create within 10 years just a just an impossible temperature rise and that would be so weird i know people get very excited about how humanity could have some kind of mass spiritual awakening because of the ecological crisis um books about and that. i and i yeah and i wonder i think actually the only thing that would sort of make that like likely is uh, a methane bomb going off in the Arctic. So basically, uh, anyone who had any capability for logic, any capability for escaping uh, cowardly delusion would think we are truly fucked, we are all going to die uh, in in the coming decade, possibly even a couple of years. And um, then then it would be interesting. However, interesting not in a good way i mean but like i would rather you know i don't want to see that just for the chance of a mass spiritual awakening <laughs> um uh yeah i'm not that dark so i know it's halloween weekend but um um yeah there we go oh yeah i mean so yeah well i mean i wrote books uh my book 2012 sort of mm -hmm. was, um you know, potentially we're moving into, you know, because catas catastrophe, uh, mass destruction, then also potentially like awakening, mutation, transformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a number of people like um, who, who've, you know, been on that track, uh, writers and thinkers. And some people have actually, like there's a book called LSD and the Mind of the Universe uh, by this guy, Christopher. Mm -hmm. and he's like a, you know, respected kind of mainstream academic. But he went on like 150 high dose LSD trips uh, with his wife as his trip sitter. And he encountered this whole like prophetic vision of the future where things would totally break down. But as they broke down, humanity would kind of like awaken and reform these kind of micellial community networks. And after you know some period of time, there would be this you know, regeneration and, and new movement. So I guess I've, I've often had that type of uh, um, idea. But I mean, I'm also interested in like, uh, you know, Dino Telhard, <laughs> Uh, this Catholic mystic and paleontologist and the whole idea of the newosphere. Um, so, you mean, because you, you, you talked about, um, yeah, there've been previous apes with brains who could sing or or talk or make weapons or whatever, and that could happen again. But I guess one issue would be in terms of the life cycle of the planet as a whole, uh, this was our one shot to build like a global industrial civilization, uh, you know, with mm. fossil fuel resources, the minerals. So that doesn't, transition into something else than the planet's like one shot and you know it, it you know it, it might also be you know from like the Gaia hypothesis idea these are I know these are sort of quasi mystical or these kind of like theoretical that like um you know maybe there is like a, a underlying like purpose or telos 
you know, and um, actually, yeah, like in, in the same way that, um, you know, a fetus develops in the womb with very specific signals and, and processes of development, like the brain becoming, <laughs> oh, it almost feels like humanity has been doing that on a global scale, you know, if you're looking at it in terms of like, you know, building a satellite dish is kind of like the uh, micro, you know, microorganisms building the structure of an eye. You know, building um, this network of communications is kind of like a brain learning to uh, recognize itself and be able to communicate with itself and so on. So um, yeah, so I still hold out a faint hope, although, although I'm, you know, I suppose more pessimistic that there might be a as, as unlikely as it seems an underlying like new spheric purpose like actually that uh and that it's only obviously some kind of intense uh crisis that there would be a, an evolutionary shift because at the moment we're into tribalism and um you know psychopaths and sociopaths rise to the top of corporate hierarchies and, and, all, and all that kind of stuff okay so there's, there's a there's a few things there um yeah uh wow where to start so um, when I think of any of these uh, explanations, narratives, um, hopes, wishes, stories, even if they are associated with either ancient wisdom, ancient prophecy, or altered states, uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness, and um, in the end, when we are uh, using language, uh, we are speaking to each other, we are trying to make sense of the world where in that process there is the ego and there is the ego wanting to affirm uh and reassure and feel safe and feel like there's meaning as well and so i'm always thinking well what are all these stories doing for us and why might they be attractive to us um and and I'm very critical in my book of of uh, what I call over modernity. So like uh, modernity on steroids gone berserk. And so therefore, I'm thinking, well, what are some of the deep stories like the notion of uh, humans at the center of the universe um, or that progress occurs um, and is inevitable and is good, uh, whether that's to do with humans or to do with uh, evolution uh, or consciousness and so I look at all those things and I'm I, I kind of I, I question them um, and I'm wondering you know what not only what the evidence is for them but what what kind of ideological work are these stories doing and what work are they these things doing and just helping us feel a bit more safe uh, uh, and what maybe they're distracting us from so that's always in the back of my mind when I talk about any of these ideas um, and I'm also very, very influenced. I think I couldn't have got the book done. I couldn't have lived the way I've done in the last five years without um, learning a lot from Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice, where I've got to this level of just allowing uh, reality, including all the things that we may label good, bad, evil, beautiful, uh, dark light, progress regress just 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 allowing all of that and that has also i think helped me realize that actually perhaps the highest form of consciousness uh on planet earth uh in the last few hundred thousand years might not be humans and if it is humans it might have been how we were 20 30 thousand years ago or it might be the indigenous people still in the forest in ecuador uh not us not the kind of people who are like me that are writing books or like you that are writing books um for me all that all of that is is possible and so i'm yeah i i don't get super excited with stories of how this cataclysm how this apocalypse how this collapse how this breakdown whatever words we want to use for the unraveling of life as we know it i i don't i don't i don't need to see it as as this sort of like uh rite of passage into homo sapiens having higher consciousness and therefore delivering on their grand purpose in the universe or on planet earth i don't need to see it that way well and i and i'm and i'm careful about that because i think that can distract us from just being fully present to how to be helpful, kind, wise uh, in the moment. So there's a lot of suffering right now 
for humans and wider life. And there's a lot more to come. And there's a lot of unnecessary suffering that, that we could avoid. Um, if we just be attentive to what's going on and care rather than and anything which numbs us is a problem. And I do wonder whether some of this, it's almost like spiritual bypassing in this context becomes planetary bypassing. And that's like, where he's like, oh, well, all this mess, it's okay because, you know, it's our destiny. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm always coming back to like, what might help now for us to reduce harm now? And so that's also, so I, I, I question any of these stories in that way as well. Make uh, sense or not? It does make sense. I mean, um, you know, it's a, I think it's a fun discussion to have. And, and you're saying that Buddhist practice has become part of your life. And, you know, I mean, Buddhism, you know, obviously has a kind of um, metaphysical understanding. You know, um, yeah. Buddhism talks about uh, samsara is nirvana. You know, there's kind of um, consciousness. Mm -hmm. kind of, um, unfolding through you know the different bardo state and so on uh, there's reincarnation and so on i mean do you have any um feeling or association or curiosity about those types of uh ideas or is it more really just the, the staying focused staying presence kind of um um yeah good questions so for me just to say that like and f for me what's happened by studying social and environmental problems and coming to the conclusion that industrial consumer societies are already breaking down and things are going to get really bad. What's happened for me is that's become uh, a spiritual invitation. And for so many people I know who take this seriously and allow it to fuck them up emotionally, psychologically, create despair in them, allow that despair in some cases, depression, it, it has allowed them to um, emerge um, uh, more beautifully in the same way grief does, you know, um, there's been, you know, quite a, a, an unusual amount of death in my life around me this year compared to the rest of my life. And it, it, it well, totally well, brings this sense of honor and gratitude and and wonder to like about life because it ends and because it's, it's something about life has gone forever so i think that's what's happening so a lot of people are are getting that kind of spiritual invitation it doesn't mean that everyone will there'll be a lot of people who just sort of react with ego affirmation and worldview defense and just get really aggressive with the sticking to the you know doubling down on their worldview and psychology theories terror management theory shows that will happen to many people but many people yes it's been it, for me uh, the only way well it was my way of living with this outlook was to really um look uh, to, to benefit from spiritual teachings and ancient wisdoms and buddhism it was the big one for me so yeah i could talk a bit about that um Reincarnation, I'm not that bothered with. Um, uh, what I love about Buddhism is uh, the idea of um, some of the ideas of original human nature. So this the Brahma Vihara, these aspects, I talk about it in the book. Um, and that's really important to me that actually the original human nature is to be compassionate, is to feel vicarious pleasure at other people's joy, is to have a general benevolence to, benevolence to life, and is not to need any of those feelings, to have some equanimity. And so those are four things which are also seen as virtues. But what's crucial for me is they're seen as the original state of the human prior to sort of emotional injury through growing up in society and, and, and getting defiled and deluded through society. So it's a it's a view that actually therefore that we just need to help people come back to who they really are um and and that's very different from we're constantly bombarded with messages that somehow you know we're dangerous to each other Absolutely. and that uh, in a desperate situation like climate change that we all need to be you know um controlled and disciplined more for our own good so so that aspect of buddhist philosophy very important to me First, when you say we need to come back into you know our essence or whatever, uh, why why do we need to do that? Um, <clears throat> oh, um, 
I have this strong, um, I have this strong uh, wish for commitment to um, uh, people living uh, from a, a spirit of, of universal love, from kindness and openness and curiosity. Um, I have a, a strong wish and uh, for more people to be fully who they are connected to themselves, to others, to wider nature. I have this sense of um, not just sadness, but anger about people being manipulated, coerced, controlled. Um, yeah, so I'm, I guess spiritual liberation is, is, a, is a big thing for me. Um, and that's, you know, I, 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 maybe my life would be a lot easier if I didn't feel that way. <laughs> but it seems to be just part of who I am. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, I mean, mm. uh, we're maybe going down a metaphysical, by, you know, you know, kind of like, um, which are, you know, maybe, maybe we can talk about more uh, in person or something. But I mean, um, yeah, from, mm -hmm. yeah, from implicit kind of a millenarianism or sort of a chiliastic impulse, even in, in that idea, uh, which to mm -hmm. me, not that distinct from the stuff that I'm talking about. I mean, I think we have like a deep in our internal compass, a sense of like, you know, the world is not supposed to be like this. Like there's a way that we can mm. move something else. And in that is a kind of, uh, yeah, it's like, it's like, a, it's like an esoteric kind of a yearning or something to uh, mm -hmm. um, anyway. So it, it just uh, popped into my mind. Um, I, I suppose one thing I would say on that is that, um, there is there does seem to feel a a fundamental truth like a, like as in this is the re the realist way of being um that comes from non-ordinary states of consciousness where your sense of a separate self um is lessened or disappears and either through a sense of we space with others or just connection and immersion and co-being into being with nature or, or even beyond that with the widest cosmos and consciousness in general so i in that and some some people are lucky enough to have have, have experienced that i i am and and i'm pretty sure you have too from all the stuff you write about and your 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 interests and so that that's there as a as a reality that seems deeply and eternally true and therefore oh yeah i'm i'm interested in in, in uh, helping reduce the unnecessary impediments to people and me included being in touch with that truth you might enjoy i think i even recommended him to you before i've been recommending him all over the place this uh philosopher Bernardo Kastrup. Did we talk about him? He wrote a book. I did a podcast mm. with him too, uh, if you're okay. not But uh, he wrote a book called Why Materialism is Baloney uh, and another book called The Idea of the World. So he was like a rational scientist working at CERN and, um, you know, sort of like fascinated with the hard problem of consciousness and so on. He began to realize that, um, you know, if you looked at quantum physics, if you looked at, uh, you know, philosophy, you looked at the hard problem of consciousness and you flipped the whole thing, and uh, sort of recognized um, kind of that consciousness is actually the the, the reality, like everything is actually consciousness uh, projected or expressing itself. And ultimately there's like one unified consciousness that's uh, instinctively, you know, expressing itself through us and through all of our creative capacities and so on that wants to know itself kind of like through us, then um, it all, everything sort of makes sense. Like the, the hard problem dissolves, uh, the, the paradoxes of quantum physics dissolve. So he, he's become the most um, kind of uh, powerful uh, kind of um, uh, proponent of, of this analytic idealist philosophy. And uh, as, as an aspect of that philosophy, which I really think is, is much more sensible than uh, reductive materialism or any form of uh, uh, you know, dualism in a way, is um, yeah that that if there is a, a this consciousness that's instinctively kind of expressing itself through all of us to learn about its creative capacities to to play with its possibilities and so on, uh, that also means we have the intrinsic right to understand our worlds allegorically again, which is very much how uh, you know alchemists or 
animists or shamans understand the world like if a if a you know if if you know your father just passed away like if a butterfly was to come into your window and and and, and you know jump onto your finger like you would intuitively feel it's like a message from the other worlds but then your rational mind would be like no that's not the case whereas for these animistic cultures you know they would they would support you and they've built up these these sort of um structures of like language and being that that are around um the correspondences and the signs that they believe come to us all the time uh, through through the world. Yeah. So I I've I live in a way where I hold the all of these things as possibilities. So um I don't see it as macabre. I see it as an incredible honor that I I, I missed my father's death, but I got back just a few hours after he died, and so I sat with uh, his lifeless body for a couple of hours and in that situation talking to him and I thought so dad wow you might be merged with the total universal consciousness now what a trip that is you know so there was this sense of wow dad you're having an like whoa but, but then also hold on no you might be dad consciousness existing as dadness Pete, <laughs> Peter Bend or my dad um, and you're here, you're kind of still here around me. And, and so I can talk to you with that idea. And then, okay, in that case, what do I want to say? And, 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 and mark this moment, or oh, wow, you could be reincarnated. Wow. You're going to, what's, well, that's going to be another big trip. Wow. Good luck with that. And I started thinking, saying some things on that. And then the, the other idea was actually maybe everything that you were has gone. You are just flesh and bones here dead in front of me. And the way that that you have existence is all the the memories, the impacts that you've had on other people. And so I'd noticed in the three hours since I'd known he four hours before I'd known he died before I got there, um, I was having conversations with him. Um, so he was more alive suddenly in my consciousness but maybe I was just having a conversation with my idea of my father. And so I, for me, all these things are, are possible. And at the, at the moment, I think I'm okay. It's almost like I'm, I'm richer. I'm, um, I'm more in awe of life by allowing all of those possibilities. And, um, yeah and then i don't know where yeah and for me that's where i'm at now and and so I, I at the moment i don't need to pick one story of uh the nature of the universe and consciousness and everything and how humans fit in with that and where we're going and in order to somehow have a sense of a foundation for my life i don't i don't I don't seem to need that. I just want everyone to be a lot kinder as things fall apart. <laughs> so okay, let's, let, let's transition out of the metaphysical. Thanks for going down that. Sure. Uh, that so um, let's talk about the uh, the falling apartness. Um, yes. So, you know, give, give me a little bit. So you did all this research. You looked at the whole situation. Mm -hmm. and years you talked to, you know, economists, uh, you know, everybody else. What do you what do you think is where are we going to be in like 10 years, like five, 10 years, like or even maybe three years? Like. You know, do do you think that we're in this? You know, yeah, like we're, you know, I mean, I'm I'm personally, I have, I must admit, mm -hmm. um, getting very concerned about uh, you know farming, food supplies, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that the Colorado River is 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 now like a Colorado stream. You know, yeah. uh, you know, reading about um, effects. You know, already like olives have got up tw tw or twice. You know, olive oil is twice as expensive as it was a year ago or something feels like there's a massive unpredictable changes happening and you know even in new york which is an incredibly it's absurdly expensive place like all the prices keep going up and up and you're like wow i can't believe i just spent like 40 dollars for a pickle you know um so um you know let's 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 uh you know i'm sure i'm curious what your perspective prognosis uh you know gentle predictions might be you know sure um well Daniel, if you want to, and if any of your viewers want to, you will come up with excuses to postpone uh, changing your life, <laughs> changing where you live, 
um coming up with oh maybe it's a bit a bit and that's what i did yeah i just but now i'm at a different place whereas that i could tell you okay this is what's happening this is how long it might take this is a research paper i read this that and the other but everything could actually snap tomorrow <laughs> and you know suddenly if uh, the financial system snapped tomorrow um oof, wow i wouldn't want to be living in a big city um a long way away from where food's grown um yeah so for me every time now because i've chosen to live very differently i now live in a rural place uh i've chosen to liberally to live there and to work close I've, I've launched an organic regenerative farm and a farm school I've, I've decided to i've decided to live beautifully according to my values in a way also which deals with this sort of uh panic i feel every time i set foot in a city now <laughs> because that's just it i do i do feel the fragility of all these international supply chains and everything so um i'm going to answer your question when i'm going to say but you and people who watch this could listen to it and go yeah that's interesting oh that's a bit oh i'll just just i'll just forget about that for now um so at some point um you're gonna have to make a decision like do i want to is it more according to my values and who i am to live my current life to the fullest most caring most helpful most creative until things go snap and then i'll just I'll just be in a disaster zone like everyone else uh, queuing up for a bit of bread and waiting for the truck to take me off somewhere like and that's that's a conscious choice you make and I know some people who've made that conscious choice they think they thought no I'm just going to stay here and live my life and try and help my neighbors with techniques like nonviolent communication and 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 help my community become a bit more loving and to try and help us collapse with a bit less nastiness, but this is certainly not a place to live if I'm interested in further longevity. So, um, but that's, you know, so you don't have to all just decide to go and try and, uh, you know, grow your own veg or live in, in community that requires less electricity to get through the day. Um, so having said that, oh, to answer your question, well- oh, One second, one second. Yeah. Does, it actually, right. does it actually require less electricity? I don't even believe that. I mean, my friends well, who went to Costa Rica or New Zealand and stuff, oh communities you know yeah they're growing you know they've got beautiful little things they feel good about themselves they're preparing for the end times but you know they're driving all over the place and they still fly oh. around intentional conferences i mean um yeah i just don't i don't even know because i feel that cities are actually vast economizers of uh, shipping and uh energy consumption and so on i mean like um uh, compared to people who live in you know suburban and rural areas so i i, I don't know i think in a way city 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 dwellers could be seen as the uh, ecological heroes in a weird way. And, um, you know, I don't know, it's just uh, turning it around a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'd rather live in a place that uh, has some rain all year round because it's in the middle of a tropical ocean with, with volcanoes, which then provides gravity fed irrigation for very fertile soils with year round growing season with no harsh winters to get through. So therefore no heating required. And also its own natural air conditioning by just going up the mountain if it gets a bit hotter. So, uh, uh, and, and yeah, and when the population all has still has small holdings and is used to farming for themselves as well as each other and pulling together when there is economic collapse, which Bali has had uh, periodically quite often. So um, I'd, I'd rather live there and I have chosen to live there and I'm plan and I'm planning on and and I know I, I am living a very sort of light life if it wasn't for for coming back for family reasons I wouldn't have stepped on an airplane now although I'm doing a planning my first world tour next year for the first in seven years to get the book out in Spanish Chinese Hungarian. I, 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 I guess I, yeah. I also feel a little bit of resistance I have so many friends who've gone off to Bali and Costa Rica New Zealand yeah it also kind of feels like um a continuation of a, of a sort of western mindset it's like yeah like mm -hmm. we just go somewhere else and you know our place is, is fucked now so we'll just move to a more beautiful tropical place and i mean it feels a little bit to me like a form of like high-end colonialism 
Um, yeah, I, there's absolutely an issue of privilege, but um, so I'm being anti-colonial in what I'm doing. I've only taken a lease on land for 15 years and we're working with very much with the, in partnership with the community and local NGOs, and we're only going to be promoting uh, organic, resilient, regenerative farming to the extent that the local people want to do it. And um, so, yeah, I'm very conscious of those things. I am relatively privileged there, but privilege is a relative thing. And I couldn't afford to do anything like this yeah. in the West yeah. because property prices have, and land prices have been inflated by our banking system, where all the money, like 80 something percent of money in the UK issued into circulation is in the form of mortgages that pumps up. So I, have, I, I, I am relatively poor in the UK, um, but I'm relatively rich in the country I've chosen to live in. So yeah, a lot of people can't do what I do because they've, 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 for example, got kids and all responsibilities and wherever they're living. I didn't. I had the freedom to choose. And but I'm just just aren't. I I I've made the choices I have for the reasons I, I explained. To this other issue of whether cities. Uh, yeah, no, I I can't agree with you because um, from an old paradigm the one I worked in for 20 odd years of trying to encourage a, a sustainable transition, then absolutely. Let's try and green the city, make it as efficient energetically as possible. And all the things you mentioned about, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, the shipping and stuff would mean that, you know, distribution in ways which will have a lower carbon footprint. Um, but I'm talking about a new situation situation where complex supply chains will break down. So I just want to be closer to um, where I, I want to be less reliant on the world. I want to be more reliant on my local area for my basic needs. And I want I know that's 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 the shift when you begin to think like this. Um, that means I don't have a very positive message for people who live in cities. In fact, uh, and, and I and that felt really bad. And I know there are people who will therefore say, oh, this is a really callous guy who's just dismissing uh, the future of billions of people who live in cities. Well, um, but that's kind of like, well, no, I'm not. I'm just me seeing things as I am and making the choices I am. And I'm absolutely continue living in cities and try and make them as green as possible. Good. And um, fine. But but I still have my view of, of it's not going to work. And so I want to live somewhere else. <laughs> so, yeah, at, this point, but, um, I guess at, this, at this point, I'm like, you know, I'm not hyper focused on feeling that I have to survive to the to the mm -hmm. moments, you know, um, I mean, we'll see what happens, but I mean, I, I also feel like I'm kind of indigenous to New York. I have like a sort of historical connection to the, to the cultural legacy of New York. Like my mother was part of the, the beats. My dad was an abstract painter. You know, I feel like this is my indigenous home and awesome. maybe I go to like Berlin or something, which also feels, you know, very close to me, but I mean, um, yeah, I'm sort of like, all right, like I'm just, this is, this is the, the story, you know, country, having a story through me. You know, of, of uh, you know, this New York psychedelic intellectual, you know, witnessing, you know, the the approaching, you know, catastrophic end times. And I'm just going to. Like, yeah. You know. So you're you're making excellent choices, too, in terms of your gifts, your networks and your where you found meaning and where you have an audience and, and people need you to still be you and continue being you. And where you live is 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 a system that creates you being you. So. I'm not saying uh, go and become a boring farmer. That would be that would be unfortunate. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, maybe at the last minute, one of my friends will take me in to their utopia, and uh, you know. Oh yes, 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 yes. By the way, if any of my friends are watching this, don't expect that of me because a lot of people do, <laughs> and that's just not that's just not how it's going to work. Sorry. <laughs> but I notice you slightly. No, uh, but that, but that, that I say that as a bit of a joke. But you know, of course, yeah, yeah, you try. Yeah. But there are so many people who actually think that. I meet. People people who say, oh, yeah, I'm sorted. They say, why are you sorted? Oh, well, I know someone who's got a love farm. It's like, okay, do they know you think that? Oh, well, <laughs> oh, I'm sure they'll take me in. Yeah, how many dozens of friends think like that? <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, of course. Um, I tell that you slightly uh, dodged the uh, the question a little bit when I was asking you for the time. I probably just forgot. What was the question? On the timetable of, uh, you know, prediction. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. 
All right. So, um, okay, things have got extremely scary because of what's happened with the climate in 2023. So, um, uh, um, the IASSA, EASA, they're in v Vienna and they do the best modeling on uh, international food systems. Um, and they uh, published, I think, a paper in 2019. Um, which uh, crunched all the numbers from past multi breadbasket failures. Uh, so that's so there are a few crucial um, places for exporting the main grains. So we're talking wheat, corn, or maize, barley, rice, and um, and then you know the China, America, Ukraine. Uh, in India, there are a few places that are just massive for, for wheat, for example. And yeah, so they did a modeling and they said that, um, so the, sorry, to, so a multi bread basket failure is where a number of those are all damaged at the same time. And the problem is with an increasingly wavy jet stream, because just like a river gets more wavy when it loses energy. Um, so the same happens with the jet stream and that causes blocking uh, of air and therefore more droughts or more intense periods of cold or heat or more intense periods of precipitation. It just becomes more wavy. It becomes more problematic, extreme weather wise. And then because of what that's happening in the cross of the northern hemisphere, uh, that's going to could hit all those um, bread baskets at the same time. So they predicted that within um, uh, once the world has gone past the 1.5 degree Celsius above pre-industrial average temperatures, um, that a multi bread basket failure is certain within three years. And if you're comparing that with intergovernmental panel on climate change past projections, where they were saying in 2018, oh, um, if we manage to cut carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, that gives us a 50% chance of avoiding 1.5 degree warming by 2050. <laughs> that was only five years ago <laughs> when they were saying that. Um, and you compare that with what Berkeley Earth said about three weeks ago, that it's very likely that 2023 will on average be 1.5 degrees above C above pre-industrial. Um, so we're there already decades ahead of what the consensus institutional science was saying. Uh, so yeah, put two and two together and therefore we'll, what that would mean by the end of 2026, 2027, uh, multi bread basket failure. What does that mean? Doesn't mean that we suddenly don't have food, yeah. but wow, that will create. Uh, well, we know what happens. Uh, countries will start banning exports. I mean, uh, India has already. Um, that will all happen. Um, so it will compound the problem. And then, and then of course, we have these. The international trade in grains is controlled by these multinationals, and so they won't do nice. You know, they won't suddenly become humanitarian actors. So the, suddenly the prices will just go absolutely crazy and that will kick off um, unrest um, and understandably so. And um, so that could start a real downward doom loop um, uh, just in uh, just in uh, three, three years from now. Yeah, that's one. That's one way. There are multiple ways where it could all get very messy very quickly. Um, so that we, so we could talk about that and but we could also talk about something else which is just that um you mentioned prices earlier the way that people living uh, normal urban lifestyles will experience well not even urban lifestyles just lifestyles where we are consumers the way we experience the creeping collapse of modern life is through prices and they're just going to get more and more expensive and it's not going to be any kind of temporary inflation it's going to be reflecting um, the degradation and destabilizing of the biosphere and the atmosphere. So, um, as well as internal contradictions of capitalism and, you know, all, all the, all the other stuff that's going on that I talk about in the book. So project projections, um, I would be astounded if, um, uh, 
I would be astounded if people living in, in where I am now in the UK or where you are in America are um, having this, this similar levels of modern convenience, uh, supermarkets full of affordable food, at least for the majority of the population, um, within five years, um, I think less than that. And that was my projection back in 2018. Um, I didn't say it in the paper. I said I thought collapse was inevitable, collapse of modern industrial consumer societies because of environmental change, particularly climate change. But I, but when I was interviewed, I said, well, I'm living my life as if life as I know it, modern conveniences and capabilities so um, will have broken down wherever I'm living by 2028. So I, I still think that really. Um, uh, what about, um, uh, Jim, what yeah. about sort of the, the pushback would be obviously, I was just, you know, pulling up this tech optimism manifesto, which is a very extreme statement. Oh, yes. But I mean, I remember back in like 2008, uh, I was very compelled by uh, the peak oil theorists, like Richard mm -hmm. Heidegger and Dmitry Orlov, and uh, they were basically saying, you know, it's, um, it's kaput, uh, you know, and then Obviously, they discovered um, non-conventional sources of oil, like shale, uh -huh. and, so on. and so they kept the machine going. So I guess the, you know, the the, the tech optimist, the um, you know, market-driven fundamentalist answer would be, yeah, there's problems, but uh, that's just going to fuel innovation, and uh, mm -hmm. you'll see things like nuclear fusion uh, is on the horizon. Uh, you know, using genetic... Uh, I love it. It's always on the horizon for yeah. my entire life, ever ever since I could even, like, read. Yeah. <laughs> it's always on the horizon. But uh, then you have, yes. like, uh, you know, genetic, okay. so the, genetic engineering. Yeah. So the eco-modernist argument is, is Julian Simon, the ultimate resource, 1981. He was the, the big famous proponent of it. Yeah. Um, what do I think about that? Well, I'll just... To, so I, I didn't realize how much I believed that. I didn't realize how much I was an eco-modernist until I actually looked into the into it. So a couple of data points. Um, just the UK, where I am here, 1% of the world's population. Um, if all uh, combustion engine vehicles were to all be electric vehicles, that would take up twice the annual uh global production of cobalt which is uh, currently needed in the batteries so using current technologies so that's just one percent so so then the uh, sorry, techno sorry. salvationist eco-modernist response is oh but then we'll find new batteries there's always a or, or, uh, or, or, a new or we'll, or we'll learn how to mine the okay. asteroids ah, so um the international energy agency of the un did a critical minerals report about two years ago, and they they looked at um, just for transport and household, which is a small part of the total energy consumption on the planet. But they looked at that and they thought for the batteries required for that, um, it anywhere between four hundred and four thousand percent increase. Uh, in, in in the annual production of of, of the, the the crucial rare earth metals and the, that's just impossible and then there are no, no plans to do that and guess what where are those metals <laughs> they're under the feet of indigenous peoples who are the most pristine environments so basically this eco-modernist dream uh, they're just caught, you'd mentioned colonialism after in order for them to drive their Teslas and live the dream and pretend to it lie to each other this this is the future they're going to be destroying um, the last amazing wilderness areas uh, on the planet and um, in a new wave of so called green colonialism and it's already started. And there's a belligerence behind it. Elon Musk said, you know, we'll coo whoever we want to when someone said, um, oh, but all these these metals you need for Tesla and Bolivia. Um, so it's just we're going to see the same old, same old. And um, and, and and for me, this is terror management theory. The, the, the eco-modernists, uh, they're not being scientific. 
they, there's no way that they're presenting a theory that could be refuted. So there's no possibility of falsification. And yet they sort of claim to somehow be um, uh, using, you know, they claim to be wedded to enlightenment values and science and technology. It's pure ideological fanaticism. They're not actually proving anything when they put these ideas forward. And what I'm doing is just pointing to existing trends and extrapolating. That's all. There's no magical speculation. And because we're in a culture that assumes human dominant dominion, human progress, um, there's this idea that the burden of proof is on someone like me or, or I'm the one who's being a bit odd and pessimistic. No, they're just being wackos. But because we live in a wacko culture that assumes that technology is so supreme and humans are supreme, which comes from a deep delusion of our separation with nature, um, that people think that that's the, the, the kind of the more positive way of being. No, it's not. It's just madness. Just for fun, I thought I would read you a little bit of, from the Mark Andreessen uh, Techno Optimist uh, Metaphor. <laughs> okay. Where he, where, he, where he identifies, there's a section called The Enemy. Uh, we have enemies. Oh, yes. Our enemies are not bad people, but rather bad ideas. Our present society has been subjected to a mass demoralization campaign for six decades against technology and against life under various names like existential risk, sustainability, ESG, sustainable development goals, social responsibility, stakeholder capitalism, precautionary principle, trust and safety, tech ethics, risk management, degrowth, the limits of growth. This demoralization campaign is based on bad ideas of the past, the zombie ideas, many derived from communism, disastrous then and now that have refused to die. You scared? <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> I mean, that's just someone. That's just someone writing. It sounds like someone just writing something to have a bit of a laugh. You know, I gave up debating at university. I thought it was a bit stupid back then. I'm much more interested in actually what's the truth and and looking at the, uh, and 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 dialogue. But that just sounds like a puerile entertainment. Got it. Well, listen, when, I'm excited. <laughs> so, uh, like, yeah, I mean, maybe there's something much more substantive in his work. So I don't mean to be uh, uh, just dismissive and rude. Uh, but I, that, I, that, 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 that was that that was just that was just yeah, it's pure old rhetoric. It's just a load. It all comes from communism. How 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 stupid! Like like really. <laughs> I, mean, I, I know <laughs> many of people, a bunch of people in the Silicon Valley, like high level ecosystem. Sustainable development goals, by the way, is the ultimate of capitalist ideology that we can spread capitalism and consumerism to every corner of the planet and include everyone in a consumer industrial consumer way of life. And he's calling that something to do with communism. It's moronic. It indicates absolutely no understanding of anything. Why would one even keep reading past that sentence? Fair enough. Yeah, well, actually, I, I remember reading about that in your book also. And of course, I've had the same thought. But tell me a little bit about your uh, critique of the SDGs uh, in that sense. Well, the whole, I mean, sustainable development as a concept, you know, that we can meet to, to everyone's needs today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that all sounded lovely. And it was super exciting for me as a young person in 1992, thinking about what I was going to do in my in my career. And so, yeah, I, I believed I worked in sustainable development. That was my vision. That was my hope. But so, but basically, it is. It was about turning the whole of humanity into consumers of in, in mass-produced products and turning everyone into a worker in in corporations within capitalism. Uh, and it, you know, the the fall of the end of the Cold War that happened around the same time as sustainable development becoming uh, like the new sort of global framework, the new ideology for international cooperation and globalization. I mean, that that just took off, but um, that's coincided with the absolute annihilation of, of life on earth. So in, for example, I'm, I'm 51, and in my life, uh, is it, I think about 64% of wildlife has been eliminated by us humans. So we've got to a point now where there are only 4% of mammals on earth are um, anything other than humans, pets or livestock. So, you know, we, we, we're massively destructive and, and the things, all manner of things that will be called sustainable development have been part of that engine of total 
destruction. Um, so yeah, I now no longer like the notion of sustainable development. And also in the book, I, I, I then judge the sustainable development ideology on its own terms. So the 17 sustainable development goals, look at how we're doing, the UN's own report on them, and we're failing on all of them, and we have no chance of getting anywhere near any of them. We're going backwards on most of them now. Um, and what I also talk about is if you look at the data, the Human Development Index, the Numbio Quality of Life Index, all these things, you crunch all the numbers together, you realize that when they were all on the stage in New York at the UN, all the world leaders signing off on their SDGs to Agenda 2030, for the majority of people on that stage, their countries had already started their persistent decline into ultimate collapse. And it's the fact that they're all privileged. Well, they just don't know about this. And this is the problem of our systems. Is the, and this is the people who study the collapse of ancient civilizations say, well, it's clearly that the elites, the leaders, the people in charge, politically, ideologically, perhaps spiritually, because a lot of these places have temples, they were so disconnected from the reality. So um, Good point. it's the same thing with the SDGs. It's just a load yeah. of nonsense. Yeah. Uh, um, I got a next, another question for you. Um, so and I'm looking forward to also because you're going to be part of this um, kind of uh, seminar we're doing, building our regenerative future, uh, which we hope is vaguely possible in some long term sense. Um, but I, I, what I know, one thing I saw in the book was um, you were kind of coming up, coming against there being sort of like big centralized solutions and basically focusing on, uh, you know, kind of individual resilience, community sovereignty as um, the path forward. And, some of that seemed to be kind of inflected by the whole thing that happened with the COVID vaccines in a way, and the sort of movement against the, you know, for like bodily sovereignty and, and health and so on. So I thought maybe you could, uh, you know, ex explore a little bit about, about your hypothesis there. Yeah, this book, the, the, you can't see it. Uh, the subtitle is, is a freedom loving response to collapse. And um, I actually quite enjoyed how that might grate with a lot of the sort of the normal sort of middle class, middle of the road greens, <laughs> which is my kind of professional and epistemic community, um, because it's really odd how uh, interest in liberty, freedom, personal uh, human rights has kind of become denigrated as somehow selfish and reckless um, in, in through the mass media in many Western countries. What I, I've lived um, I've lived uh, half my adult life in the global south, different countries, and I think there's a very different feeling about what freedom means, which is it's just naturally understood as a collective struggle against oppressors, rather than this idea that it's always oh, just being selfish, you just want to do your own thing, you don't care, you're immoral, you don't wear a mask, you're not going to get vaccinated to save your, your grandmother, you know, all that sort of stuff, which is this, this sort of new anti anti freedom or pro freedom discourse that there's this bifurcation that's happened in the West, particularly in America, perhaps. Um, so yes, I in the book, I advance something I call eco libertarianism. It's not right wing libertarianism. For me, right wing libertarianism is fundamentally flawed for not looking at how large corporations actually steal our freedoms and take over government. And there's this corrupt merger of state and corporations that occurs. And that if we, um, if we want to uh, enable each other's freedoms, um, we have to work collectively against uh, oppression uh, and coercion, no matter how it shows up through whatever institutional entities, whether that's religions, corporations, the state. Um, so it's a left libertarian view, therefore. Um, and eco libertarianism basically means that um, we believe that if people are not coerced and manipulated and rewarded for behaving in ways which are uh, destructive to each other in nature, then we wouldn't have arrived at this awful situation. And so that for me, I have a whole chapter explaining the expansionist monetary system and how it drove collapse. Um, I talk about us being unfree. I talk about the whole information ecology being distorted by the power of capital and money in that way. Um, so we don't, most of us don't know what's going on and we don't have good quality dialogue about what's going on and what to do about it. Political process is completely hijacked by different factions of capital. So I talk about all that and I say that um, the one upside of what is a sad 
scary situation of societal collapse. The one upside is new opportunities as we become free, we, we get freed up from the the system of systems of control, mind control, political, ideological control. Uh, so yeah, in practical terms, I'm I have a whole chapter celebrating people creating economic alternatives, local currencies, relocalizing tr uh, trade, um, and all that kind of stuff. So right. let's make that a focus um, when we when we uh, come back together for the uh, for the webinar. I think that'd be great. Sure. Um, and uh, by the way, I should say the reason why I put that forward is I wanted to advance a solidarity based politics for an era of collapse. Um, because I noticed that quite a lot of people are secretly turning authoritarian and okay, they became quite overtly authoritarian during the COVID crisis, the, the early phases of the pandemic, it's not over, COVID is still super damaging and we should take it seriously, but for me taking it seriously means recognising what's failed and what we could be doing differently about it in future. But um, but yeah, the many environmentalists now are so understandably freaked out by how bad the environment is, and uh, how ineffectual their efforts have been that they are becoming authoritarian. They're kind of saying, "Oh well, we just have to force everyone to change because otherwise it's too late." And we, you know, and and for me, that's just reflecting that's 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 their fear allowing dominant ideology to work through them. Um, so I'm offering something other than eco authoritarianism in this book. And what would for you then? What, what would be the proper role for a government or the state in this kind of trans, you know managed transition? You know, or is the possible is there a possibility of some kind of like, you know, if there was an acceptance of this you know inescapable collapse? Yeah, could could the governments and the states become valuable allies for for the, the human cause, or is it really just too late for that? Or, or what would that look like in an ideal sense? So, if I could wait, would it depend on which state and which part of the world? But if I could wave a magic wand, then they would be doing emergency relocalizing of production of food. Uh, the they would be helping people um, have a community owned local exchange systems and local currencies. They would be they would be brutal honesty with lots of compassion about how we're now in a in an era of retraction and regress and disturbance and there would be some kind of truth and reconciliation about a process about how we got into this mess where we recognize that it yeah some some ideas some institutions and some people were more to blame than others yes there's some blame but we don't want to just get hung up on blame and seek revenge that's not going to help get us anywhere but we shouldn't pretend that there's no blame so we need some truth and reconciliation there's all manner of things once you do it but that's if i had a magic wand and that none of that's going to happen so it's just all going to collapse none of that's going to happen because people who uh seek uh, power within hierarchies are uh, uh, generally um, people who are well adjusted to the succeeding in those hierarchies playing the game. And most of them I know are extremely uh, emotionally, psychologically needy people who need the affirmation. And so they're not going to really go deep. Also, because once you're in charge of a big organization, uh, there's this sense of responsibility to just keep the show on the road for that organization. I'm speaking from experience of hanging out with world leaders since 2012 at Davos and the UN, and, and I haven't seen any statespersonship or even capability for it. Got it. Okay, Jim. Well, we're, we're closing in on like an hour and a half. Here. Um, All right. So anyway, cheers. Uh, any, uh, yeah, like, um, you know, any, any, um, I don't know if that'd be positive thoughts or uh, redemptive hopes or anything you'd like to leave people with. Well, I thought I was being positive. You know, the elites uh, have got no, further to fall. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let, let, let them, let, you know, they got further to fall. That's great. Want, you know, <laughs> to, <laughs> they'll be want want something. To see the collapse of the elites then. <laughs> yeah. No, what's positive about it? Well, um, all right, I'll tell you this. I was thinking about it today. I went down to uh, the beach. Uh, where dad used to go with his dad and they used to go mackerel fishing as a kid and I, I love that story. Um, that doesn't happen anymore, like a rowing boat off the coast. And I was thinking about my dad and thinking, oh, I, I thought initially he changed a lot in the last five years. And then I thought, actually, no, it was me as well. And it was the, the fact that I thought that, oh shit, life could fall apart. It brought mortality in general, and my mortality and his, into my mind and into his mind, I did talk about some of this stuff with him. 
And with that context, I think um, we slowed down and became nicer to each other, more appreciative and respectful with each other. So I think I had a much better relationship with my father precisely because of my anticipation of societal collapse. Now, probably many people aren't as you know fucked up as me and they don't need to anticipate societal collapse to have a good relationship with my dad. But in my case, I think it really helped. So I felt gratitude about that today, oddly. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, there's, there's upsides to even the worst, darkest stuff, aren't there? Was it the Lao, 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 Lao Tzu said, uh, the way to illumination is, is through the dark or the path of illumination is, 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 is through the dark. So. All right. Cool. Maybe that's a nice little note to close on, but it was great to hang out with you and, uh, yeah, look forward to more, you know? Yeah. I'll see you again in your, um, yeah. in the thing you're doing. Maybe in Bali and everyone check in with my friend, uh, paradox. Uh, I don't know if we ever, if you ever made that connection. Yeah, thank you. I'm, 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 I welcome any, anyone who knows anyone in Bali who's, who's um, not into spiritual bypassing and not into being colonialist um, and wants to help collaborate with people who want to make Bali more resilient, regenerative, then get in touch. Well, oh, I guess, you know. Oh, you can find out about my project there, actually, okay. beckonze.net. Beckonze is, is a word in Buddhism for healing. Uh, it's the, the medicine Buddha mantra, beckonze.net, and then you can see what i'm up to there and what about the finding the book and uh, all that kind of social media stuff yeah. so this book is um you can download it for free see i'm not trying to profit from the apocalypse um uh it's jembandel.com you can get a free epub there um uh if you want to buy it then um there's also links to places to buy it. It's now going to be in more online retailers. It's not in your local bookshop. It's not the kind of thing that Penguin or Random House quite do just yet. But um, yeah. Uh, oh, it's on Audible as well, if you just want to listen to it. Um, yeah. Awesome, buddy. Thank you for your time. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay.